We have uh, a lot of special things going on um, this, this uh, month of August, which is coming up here. Um, maybe you have some special things going on in your life. Maybe uh, you guys, uh, like Theo, maybe you're going on vacation one more time, or maybe somebody has a birthday. Um, I know m- my daughter has a birthday um, in August. So there are a lot of things, and sometimes when we... Uh, have special things we like to celebrate. Uh, eyes up here, eyes up here, kids. Um, the um, one thing that's uh, here this summer and month of August is something called uh, my ordination anniversary, and uh, that sounds strange. So we'll kind of explain it. Can everyone first of all say ordination? Ordination. ordination. Um, In that word ordination, we have the word orders. Can you say orders? Orders. Uh, Do you ever get your orders in the morning? Like mom says, today I want you to do this or this or this. That's your orders. And um, as a pastor, I got my orders in my ordination to preach the gospel, the command of Christ to his church and to me specifically to preach the gospel and administer the sacraments. All that, kids, Theo, is a fancy way of saying it was the day I became a what? A pastor. I went from not being a pastor to being a pastor in one day. Uh, that's when they put the stole over my shoulders and the cape that we call the chasuble and uh, got a collar as well. Become, when I became a pastor, and uh, this month our congregation is celebrating the gift of the office of the Holy Ministry because 20 years ago in August, August 24th actually, Uh, was the day that I became a pastor. It was a long time ago. How many of you were here 20 years ago? No, none of you were even here. And of my children, the only children that were were, um, uh, alive was uh, my daughter, uh, Claire. Claire, is Claire here somewhere? She's here. So of all my children, the only child that was at my ordination was Claire. She's turning 21 uh, in August as well. August 26th, so that means that on my ordination day, she had just turned one, right? Uh, Have that right? Always check with the mother, right? Um, So um, this is a a month that we celebrate, but it's really not a month to celebrate me, but it's a month to celebrate how God gives pastors to his church to preach the gospel, to administer the sacraments, to baptize us, to give us Holy Communion, and to teach us the great gift to his church. So uh, this month, we'll focus a little bit about uh, on that topic of ordination. Can everybody say ordination with me? Ordination. In the, and we'll continue with our Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands to commend myself, my body and soul, and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the evil foe may have no power over me. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, before we begin with Romans, um, August, will you give me a Bible? Appreciate that. Uh, Before we begin with um, uh, review, and uh, we're going to be reading, we're going to be reading through, um, let's see. Uh, sections of Romans here, um, getting ourselves up to speed. Anything that you'd like to mention before we, before we begin? Any additions, subtractions, conversations? Deb, did the house sell yet? Uh, no. No. We no. Had an open house today. Pray okay. Pray for the open house and for a quick sale. Excellent. Anything else? Pray for Marv in the midst of uh, 
I was going to mention that afterwards, but uh, do give him your sympathies. Uh, his wife died on uh, mo Monday morning, and uh, we buried her, her then on uh, Friday here at the congregation. So it was a, it was a busy week with a uh, funeral as well. Um, anything else? Pastor, have you ever run across a woman in sheep's clothing who didn't know that they were? I, I've had trouble recognizing them over the years, except in hindsight, because they seem like they were genuinely, genuinely sincere and right. really, really thought they were doing the Lord's work. Yeah. Right. I, I think that's a good question. Let me chew on that one. Um, yeah, go ahead. Kind of answered in the same verse where Jesus uh, says of those people that there will be some people that come to me and, you know, and at the end of days will face their judgment and they're like, oh, we did all these great things. And they're so, you know, they, 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 think, they think that they've earned their salvation. They think that they've done good. And, right. And they will be cast out. Yeah, I think that that adds some clarity to it. Did you did you hear that, Michael? Yeah. Um, so I, I think that uh, there are, are many who are themselves deceived um, about that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Jesus says that, you know, uh, by your fruits you shall know them. So... Um, I think it's best to, um, as, we, as we deal with uh, speakers of the gospel or preachers of the gospel or leaders in the church, um, to judge them by their fruits. And the fruit of the prophet ultimately is, like we may, we may not be called to make that ultimate judgment, um, this is a false prophet, um, but um, to listen to the, what they speak and preach and uh, how they live. Um, and does that point back to, you know, Christ as Savior alone? So, um, yeah. Um, it's a heavy question because it's, it's possible for someone else to be deceived about themselves. It's possible for me to be deceived about myself, too. Right. Yeah, I'm not saying there's easy answers to these questions. Um, I do have to preach on this text every year. <laughs> Um, and uh, that is the challenge that we rest in Christ's promises that he will lead us and guide us by his teaching and that these things can be known um, and I think that um, you know in our, in our minds and hearts we often have these thoughts how, how do I save myself from deception how am I, how am I not deceived and where do we take those haunting questions that we often have? Am I a true Christian? Am I not? Uh, how do I know about this teacher or not? You know, the Lord t tells us that we're to continually, you know, measure and judge everything um, on the basis of, of, of God's holy word. Um, I mean, I had a situation recently, I mean, even this week where... Um, I have this gentleman that I know in the community. He's a really interesting person. I've known him ever since I've come because he introduced himself to me um, from an early time. And he's kind of well known in the Mennonite circles, kind of goes in a lot of different circles, but knows Lutheranism too. I have a few connections with him. And I saw a, you know, a news article on Fox News this week about, maybe you saw this, um, it wasn't just on Fox News, but uh, about a pastor who... Uh, what, 40 years ago had, in order to cover up, a, you know, an uh, abuse uh, that he had committed in the congregation, uh, murdered that child. And uh, in any regard, this guy called me up this week and told me, those, like, I knew this guy quite well. And, um, you know, um, imagine that for 40 years as a pa he continued to be a pastor he was uh, not convicted of the crime or, or there was not enough to convict him until here, here we are, he's 80-some or he confessed to the crime. I don't know the full story, but um, 
In the end, these things are laid open, Jesus said. Um, if not in this life, in the life to come. Um, so it seems that many people, you know, were for a time deceived as well. So um, it is an encouragement to continue to hear God's word to judge the scriptures, to be in the scriptures, to study them, um, to consider what our pastor says, um, and to ask ourselves also that question, is this faithful to the word of God? Is it not? And at times to ask the question of our pastor about his preaching, you know, or his teaching as well. So, um, I don't know, anybody else want to add anything to that? Please, Roy. Right. Yeah, right. And what Roy had said for you didn't hear at the front is what about those pastors who are mentioning or saying that all things are, all, all manner of abominations are acceptable? Um, well, all I can say is the words of what the text says. Many, if you read the section before this, it says, broad is the way that leads to damnation, and narrow is the way to that leads to eternal life. Few are they who find it. And so um, the Lord gives the impression that we shouldn't necessarily be surprised. This is what he said would always take place. And uh, we simply say, well, exhibit A. I'm constantly surrounded on a daily basis, you know, with, with God's uh, demonstrating the truth of his scripture to me. Um, but also not, you know, that I might point the finger, but but that I might also, you know, repent um, and, you know, be faithful to God's word as well. I mean, it's easy, easy, really easy to point the finger, right? It's hard, as it were, whether a pastor or a parishioner to call the sin a sin, call the spade a spade, live, you know, faithfully to God's word, and to tell people the hard things to hear. Yeah. Peace, peace, and there is no peace. Farley, please. Since we're in Romans, Romans 3.23 comes Yeah. Uh, Rome, um, Farley's bringing us back to Romans 3.23, and let's go there. Um, uh, for there is no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So let's tie this to the scriptures here. I'm going to give you an overview of... I'm going to give you an overview of, um, of kind of where we are um, by a few key verses, and then... Um, we're going to lead into reading, um, reading chapter 4 and uh, digging into chapter 5. Okay, first, uh, <coughs> excuse me. First of all, go to Romans 1.17, and uh, therein you find the theme or the thesis of the, and, and we have Bibles in the back if, you, if anybody needs to, back corner if you want, like to grab one. Uh, Romans uh, 1.17, um, we have the theme verse of the entire epistle right in chapter 1. And what is that? Could someone read 117? Uh, maybe back to 16 too. 16 and 17. I'll read it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed um, from faith for faith. The idea there is faith at the beginning, faith at the end. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So that theme verse from Hosea um, is, is it Hosea or Habakkuk? Um, that theme verse is, um, serves as the um, topic of the entire epistle that we're righteous by faith. Um, I'd like you to look at verse 18. In, in 118, he has that whole section. And what was his... What was his topic there in 118? The sinfulness of the pagan world, right? 118, uh, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness, even though it's plainly evident that God exists. Instead, man worships idols and leads to all sorts of abominations. 
And then he turns the table in 2 verse 1. And then he's talking to the Jews and he says, What? You have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges from passing judgment on another, you condemn, condemn yourself because of you. If you look at the history of the pagan world, is it a nice history or a history of wickedness and evil? Well, I think you can plainly say it's a history of wickedness and evil. Um, how about the history of the Jews? When you look at the history of the Jews, what do you find? Oh, it's bright and rosy and so beautiful. No. Um, the Jews had God's word and nonetheless strayed uh, mightily from, uh, from it. So we see, um, again, main verse, righteous shall live by faith, but then he deals with the, the sinfulness of the pagan world, and then he turns the tables, the sinfulness of the Jew, and then... Uh, he uh, talks in 3.1, well, what then is the advantage of being a Jew? Is there any advantage or point of being a Jew? And if you look at 3 verse um, uh, 2, it says they were entrusted with the oracles of God. So just because they didn't keep it doesn't mean that there were some benefits because the Jews had been given the very teachings of God, the word was given to the Jews, God's plan of salvation for mankind. Um, then in 3 to 9, we kind of get back to the topic. No one is righteous. Look at, um, you know, verse 9. What then are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous. No, no not even one. Uh, no one understands God. God looks down and what does he see? The, verse 17, the way of peace they have not known. Um, and what's the purpose of the law? Both the, the, the law that's seen in creation for the Gentile and the law that is seen in the Bible for the Jew. Uh, the law is spoken in verse 19 so that in the end what? Everybody's mouth is, is, is stopped or quieted. Okay? Um, and then... Verse 21, we start to take the turn. Well, then how is salvation obtained? Um, and in verse 1, we have, for excuse, verse 21 of chapter 3, we have, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. So there's a different kind of righteousness, that we are righteous, that is right before God in a different way, not according to the law, um, but according to some other plan, you know? It's like if, um, if you're going down the road and, you know, um, there's construction this way and construction this way, but you find, you know, a hidden trail that's leading to a different destination. Um, you know, for the Jews, it ended in judgment. For the Gentiles had ended in judgment because they failed to keep the law. Now righteousness is found a different way. But here's where we emphasize what we were teaching two weeks ago, that the law and the prophets bear witness to it. What does he want? What does, he, what does Paul want to get these Jews in Rome back to? He wants to get them back to what? The Bible. And by the law and the prophets, he means the Old Testament. The first five books are the law and the rest of it as well. So he's saying the hidden message of the fact that we are righteous by faith is evident in the Bible. And he has then several exhibits. And the exhibits are kind of where we're going to show where we left off last time. Um, exhibit one um, and exhibit two. And I'd like to say almost exhibit three as well. Um, he's going to talk about Abraham and to David and uh, then three, he's going to mention the sacrificial system. Um, specifically the atonement cover or the mercy seat. Okay. So he's going to show that in the Bible, in the Old Testament, the fact of righteousness being apart from the law was also plainly evident. How does he do it with Abraham? Very simply, he says what? 
He says, when was Abraham circumcised? Before he believed or many years after he believed? Decades after he believed. So long before he was circumcised, God took him out and showed him the sands of the seashore and the stars of the sky and said, Abraham, there's four things I'm going to tell you. I got a land for you. You're going to have many descendants. I'm going to protect you. Those who curse you will be cursed. Those who bless you will be blessed. You will be a blessing for the world. And the blessing for the world came in several ways, that the word of God would be passed down through Abraham's family and also the salvation of the world and Jesus Christ would come from the line of Abraham, those four things. And Abraham there, at that very moment, when his body was as good as dead and his wife was what? He was 90 years of age at that point in time. His wife also was barren and past the point of childbearing. Abraham looked up at the stars and says, all right, sounds like a good idea. (laughs) The Bible says it a different way, that he believed the Lord and the Lord credited it to him as what? Righteousness. That righteous, we are, how can you be righteous by faith? Well, that's what the Bible teaches. By, by, By faith in God's promises, in God's promise of Jesus to send a son through his line, Abraham believed and it was credited to him as righteous, righteousness. Now, was Abraham always a stand-up guy? Do we look at Abraham's life and see, oh, you know, he's he, you know, always following the Lord, always doing what needs to be done? No, that is to show us that it's not according to who he was as a person. And the Bible is very clear that Abraham was first a pagan. He worshipped idols by the Euphrates um, and Ur of the Chaldees. Um, um, and... Um, So the point there is he was circumcised later. The law came later, but right at the beginning of his life, we see what? Abraham is justified, made right with God by what? Faith. That's exhibit one. We'll read this. Second point we read or we thought about two weeks ago was this. How about David? Stand-up guy or not so much? Okay. Well, he is a man after God's own heart. However, his heart, he allowed to be attracted to things, his appetites gave way to, um, uh, to one thing after the other. And David in Psalm 32, we'll see this exhibit B, uh, David, Psalm 32 says, Blessed is the man whose righteousness, uh, whose iniquity is taken away and whose sin is what? Covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not count iniquity, does not impute iniquity. So what do we see here with David? He's saved because what? He's a great guy. No. What's the list after his name? Murderer, adulterer, failed father. You do the list. Failed king. You know, how would you like to have a king like that? Right? Make a lot of hay about our present leaders. Maybe we should. You know, but... Leaders haven't changed much over the years. There's a, I had one guy, I'm not in the military. I mean, my father was in the military, but my father, you know, said, don't join the military. So I didn't join the military. Well, he served in Vietnam, so you would understand why he would tell me not to join the military. But I had one guy once tell me, he was a fighter pilot, and I went to seminary with him. And um, he also had a Porsche business on the side. I remember one time we were driving this car and a circuitous route was behind us, this Porsche behind us, you know, uh, that he had restored. He's a great Porsche dealer and uh, once owned the, the first 911 ever made, owned it himself. But anyway, I was like, how much is that car that we're towing? Right? It's like 100, 150,000. I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty nice. Pretty nice. But we're delivering it to Chicago. But anyways, we we're talking about um, leadership in the military. And, he's, and he, this is how, what he told me. Anyone who has seniority ultimately got there for a reason, and it's not positive, okay? I wasn't the one who made that judgment, but he was basically saying that in order to get to positions of power, ultimately it means compromising your values and your beliefs. I'm out in the military. That's what he told me. We do see it in the uh, the political realm. Um, We saw it, however, it's always been there with David. Righteousness, however, came from David, not through what? Not through anything that he did, but by the forgiving, the forgiving grace of God who put David's iniquity away. 
And the third exhibit that we see in the Old Testament, if you would look at chapter 3, uh, verse uh, 25 or 20, uh, we, we read this last time, so I won't go through it, but verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood. That word propitiation is the word mercy seat. He comes from the day of atonement in the Old Testament, where once a day blood was placed on the altar. Sins were confessed over a sacrificial victim, in this case a goat, and that blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. If you follow the Bible carefully, you will recognize that Moses was called to build the tabernacle as a copy of what he saw in heaven. So you want to know what heaven looks like? You look at the tabernacle. And Jesus took his blood, as Hebrews tells us, not to the earthly altar, but to the heavenly altar. He presented his blood as the offering of atonement and presented and gave his blood over the mercy seat of God in heaven. So these three are three illustrations where Paul aims to demonstrate to the people at Rome that it has always been true uh, and evident that salvation is not through works, the works of the law, but salvation is found um, through faith, and through faith we are righteous. I have previewed chapter 4. We have not read it, and that means right now I can just read through the whole thing without any explanation. <laughs> chapter 4. Okay, chapter 4. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. Uh, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are what? Forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count sin, his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? Is it, in other words, is it for just the Jew or is it also for the Gentile? Remember, we got back to that point about both are under sin. Is it a promise for both? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well, and to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. That is amazing. Why is it amazing? Because in the early church, there were all these, there were all these um, what, disputes. All the Jews were saying, well, got to get those uh, Gentile people circumcised, because, you know, you can't be a Christian without being circumcised. Well, what, is, what does the Bible say here? And what does Paul clearly dem demonstrate? What? Abraham was saved long before he was circumcised. And he was circumcised later. So he is the father both of what? Those who are uncircumcised, the Gentiles, and all who are for those who what? Believe. It's faith, ultimately, that, that is that which... which, which which saves. Um, and as I mentioned last time, you know, there I am, first grade, Mrs. Roberts is my teacher in Detroit, Michigan, minority of my class. And uh, okay, kids, stand up. Father Abraham had many sons. You know the old song? Uh, maybe some of you do. I am one of them and so are you. There were no Jews in that room, let's just say. But what a joy that when we get to heaven, we can look at Abraham and say, hello, father, my patriarch. When we say these are the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, we say, what, well, these are my people, my people. You know, Abraham is my father, my, the father of faith and of all who believe. And so we rejoice at these individuals, you know. Um, 
that we all are descendant by faith uh, through, through Abraham. Uh, so this is beautiful. He goes on, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For, it, if, it, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of what? Many nations. Right? In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. That's a beautiful sentence. i got to read that again. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. i, I got to think about that. What story does that reference? In, it references it in terms of Abraham, but what is it? Uh, what is it? What does it... Um, Link us to what story in the Bible? Anyone? Genesis 1. In the beginning was the Word. God called all things into existence by the power of His Word. So how can God make me righteous? Well, He made all that exists out of what? It was dark. It was chaos. It was nothing. There was water. And God and His Holy Spirit, and the Spirit hovered over the waters through the Holy Trinity. God said, let there be light, and there was light. So by the power of His Word, God makes life. God makes light. And so He compares, as it were, the power of God of creation over the power of God in the womb. Abraham says what? Well, you made the stars, you can certainly what? If you make the stars, you can make my wife pregnant. Okay? <laughs> You know, if, if, you, if you made this wonderful world with all of these animals and such, it's not going to be hard for you to remake my body so that I, an old man, can give birth to a child. He believes in the God who can raise the dead. And that's what faith is. Faith is to believe in God despite what we see with our eyes. How can I be righteous? I continue to struggle daily with sin and unbelief and all these particular things. Okay, we'll get into that in the next chapter. But God specifically uh, quotes this, um, this passage to see, uh, well, we'll go on to verse 18. In hope he believed against hope. Isn't that great? In hope he believed against hope, that he should become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No. Unbelief, uh, no unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he, was who he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. But the words that was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. All right? Are you following me? Please. He could not have that faith without the Holy Spirit. Right. Thank you. Because he's just taken. Yeah, right. He's just an ordinary yeah. man, but he was just a God. You know, and there was a Holy Spirit. Right. Just right. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. And when he needed it. Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate what you said. Not only did he receive the Spirit at the beginning, but he received it what? Again and again. And when we say the Spirit, we mean the preaching of God's Word. God preached to him. God said, no, Abraham, I'm going to do this. And through the power of the Word, the Spirit comes. But you, don't have, you, you have to recognize that Abraham didn't receive that Spirit one, and then just simply say, okay, great. No, he had, he had years and years of time where he said, well, why isn't this promise coming? And maybe I need to take my maid um, and father a child through her. Um, all sorts of situations in his life where he, he turned his back at times in the promise and God would continue to call him back to it. 
So, yeah, so uh, no man can believe of his own accord, but by the power of the Holy Spirit, God brings him to faith as God does for us as well. So to pray for the Holy Spirit is a good thing. Um, please, Deb. That's where David was a little different because in the moment when, it, when it, his sin was so drastically revealed to him, he repented. Yeah, right. I mean, that, that again, the, the, move, the movement of the Holy Spirit, I have sinned. Yeah. Yeah. He owned it. Yeah, he owned it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm tired of running, Lord. I'm tired of running. I don't want to run any longer. Um, you know, and uh, it's a beautiful moment when, you know, we get to that moment, and it's what Romans says, his mouth was shut. You know, the guy who wrote the book of Psalms, the guy who always was talking uh, in, in speaking his words before the Lord, you know, the guy who... Um, you know, who had so much always to say was the guy who God finally silenced. I have sinned against the Lord. He quiets his, his mouth. And uh, yeah, beautiful words, beautiful words um, there. Uh, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, God grants the same to us. Good. So I want to look at, um, in our brief time here, 1 through 11. And I want to show you in 1 to 11, I'm going to I'm going to um, basically state that 1 to 11, I'm going to give it a title. And 1 to 11 is, uh, is like um, past, present, and future. I'm going to structure it as uh, kind of past, present, and future. That it talks about, um, I'm going to put this up here. Okay, number one, this section uh, is about past. Okay. Okay. Past. Um, present um, and future. We, we see a lot of that in this section. Um, the second thing, um, we're going to see that he moves from justification, uh, moves from uh, justification, you might say, um, struggling with words here, moves from justification to um, the lived experience of the Christian. I think this is helpful because, you know, our Christian life continues. So we're going to talk about the past. We were, you know, we were reconciled to God. We were made right with him, past, present. Our present life now that we have and the future. So we've kind of, in Romans, move. We're moving a little bit in this direction um, to talk about the lived-in experience of the Christian. What do we experience on a day-to-day -day basis? And then the third point is we're going to hear more about the love of God. Um, and we're going to move a little bit away from uh, the term of righteousness of God. I mean, it's always in the background. Okay, we've kind of dealt with the righteousness of God and righteous by faith. But in this section, we're going to see um, this, this thing, the, the, the love of God kind of made evident. So how do I, I always find myself, it's a hard thing to teach Romans. It's a hard thing to understand because it's like, it's like someone just talking to you. Like, well, I've heard these verses, to, but how do I wrap my head around it? What's the argument of the text? This is a way to help me understand Kind of when I look at this section, this is what I'm going to see. Past, present, future moves from justification to living an experience and deals with the love of God. All right. So I'm going to point you some verses and you're going to see this. First, let's talk about um, past. Look at one. Uh, we're looking again at chapter five. Uh, look at one, nine and eleven. In one, nine and eleven, you're going to see some past tense things. We have been what? Justified, uh, verse 1, and you may have a different version, but how about verse 9? What do we see in verse 9? We've been justified. So there's things that have, take, that have taken place in our life, and we stand in this, in this new relationship because of what God has done for us. How about verse 11? Okay. We have now have received what? Reconciliation. Okay. These things in the past now... Um, now are things that we, you know, are in and have experienced. How about present tense things? Uh, 1, 2, 11, and 3. Uh, 1, 
Uh, we now have what? Okay, peace with God. Verse 11, what? Um, okay, we rejoice uh, in God. Um, verse, um, uh, sorry, 2, I, I skipped 2. Uh, what do we have now? Access by faith. Okay, we rejoice now in the hope of the glory of God. That's a little bit future. But 3, um, as well. Um, we rejoice now in our sufferings. And then um, future things, five and six. Um, it's dealing with hope there in, in chapter in number five and uh, also um, I, I'm, I'm, missing, I'm, I'm missing kind of the future stuff, but maybe I'll pick it up as we go through this text. All right. So maybe that helps a bit. We'll see this past tense stuff, what we have now, and what we're looking for as well. Let's go to um, 5, verse uh, 1. I'll read it. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. I'm going to ask a few simple questions. How do we have peace with God? Is it on account of the fulfillment of the law? or by faith in Christ? It's by faith in Christ. Second question, is our righteousness based on, on our often imperfect obedience? Or is it based on what? Faith in Christ. Is, is your justification based on future obedience? No, it isn't. Okay? Even in part? No. Is your justification based on your contrition, based on how sorry you are? You ever played this uh, job as a parent? Or you're not quite sorry enough. Like, how, <laughs> how sorry is sorry, you know? Like, sometimes, you know, you get your kids and you recognize that they're kind of sorry, but sometimes they're just sorry because they don't get to go to baseball practice or they don't get ice cream. They're just sorry they got caught, whatever it may be. So this, you know, it's not like I turn around this morning after you say, I abhor a miserable sinner. Well, how poor are you? <laughs> how sorry are you, really? Really sorry or really, really sorry? And how sorry do you have to be before God forgives you? The point is, as it says here, is your forgiveness dependent upon how sorry you are? Is it based on your often imperfect obedience afterwards? No. Is it based on the law? No. What is it based on? It's faith in Christ. It's, it's clinging to Jesus and, and Him alone. Am I telling you, go out and sin more so that grace might increase? Paul deals with that. That's not what I'm saying here. But it is to say that the foundation of your justification is on Jesus and what He did and not in the least on, on you. Okay, um, peace is the liber... Okay, it's, uh, I'm going to deal with the word peace. Peace is the liberation of our fears. It is to know we have a God who will not punish us on account of our sins. We will be saved from eternal death and are saved right now from eternal death. The point is, is that this is life, to know that what? God has been propitiated. My sins have been atoned for. I have peace. There is no fear. This is life. That is that the liberation of all fears to know that your sins are forgiven in Jesus. This is the purpose of the gospel. Now, question, does this mean that we will not face external afflictions? Does it say here, well, now your life is going to be rosy? No, it doesn't. Does it say now that you're, you won't struggle with faith? It doesn't say that. Fightings and fears, what? Within, without, as the old hymn says. We continue to face and have the struggle of the Christian life, which we'll see in Romans, but your justification is not based on these things. Luther once said, if they put a crown of thorns around Jesus' head, don't expect a wreath of roses around your neck. Good point. Uh, what does verse 2 state that this gives us? Through him... We have also obtained access by faith into this grace which we now stand. What do we have? 
access, we have access by faith uh, into this grace. So how, what is our access by? Because we've been good? No, but because of what Christ has done for us. Our access depends on what Jesus has done for us, not on the basis of what we've done. To be, let me read to be, and we rejoice in hope, in hope of the glory of God. Now, I'm going to read my notes. This verse teaches that we should glory in hope. The hope of Christian is not a present reality. We are still sorely troubled by weakness, doubt, grief over sin, infirmity, and uncleanness. The world and our reason suggest that we do not have anything. Um, and on account of the corruption that we still see in us, we wonder ourselves. But faith trusts in the mercy of God and learns to trust and believe despite what we see. This is the point of this section, to be. So we rejoice in hope, in the glory of God. Hope is something that we don't yet what? We don't yet have the perfection, you know? RJ today isn't the RJ that will be there in eternity. Christopher today is not the Christopher that will be there in eternity. I'm not quite yet what I will one day be. Yet we have that hope of perfection, and we hope in the glory of God. And this is really important when we get to verses 3. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. This is what's going on in this section. How do the world and reason see suffering and affliction, especially as the suffering of the conscience and of the heart? God has what? Forsaken you. Job, right? God is sending this to you because what? But the Christian believes something far different. And the Christian believes totally something totally different. My Savior loves me. I see that on the cross. He has died for me. He has redeemed me by His blood. These things that I experience are not because God hates me, but actually because what? He loves me. We see in suffering His good and gracious will, despite what we think with our minds or what the world may see. And that's how this next section makes sense. What do we know as the Christian? Because we're justified by faith. Verse 3, we rejoice in our sufferings. What do we know as Christians? What is suffering going to produce? Endurance. Endurance is going to produce what? Character. And character is going to produce what? And hope will not what? Not put us to shame. Because God's love, this is where we get to the love. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We recognize as the Christian, do we want to go through these things? How many of you this week said, sign me up, Lord, for some more suffering? <laughs> How many, when you went through suffering, you've gone through suffering, you know, moan and groan on your bed and you say to yourself, ah, to hell with it, to hell with this life, to hell with whatever it may be. Why does God allow these things to happen? And yet God brings us through these things and he teaches us and, you know, he, he, Luther always said, God brings us to heaven first by putting us in hell. God raises us up first by putting us what? To death, right? And so God works the opposite. Well, we look at the cross. God worked the salvation of the world through that. And through my crucifixion, you know, God will work his good in me. God's love has been poured out into our hearts. Verse 6, and we'll finish it off just by reading through this. For why we were still strong. No, it doesn't say that. <laughs> for why we were still what? At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us, and that while we were still what? Sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified, past tense, by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. What a great chapter. What a powerful sentiment. 
Um, you know the best commentary I read this week on this? Philip Melanchthon, Luther's right-hand man who lived down the road from him. Sometimes gets a bad rap, but his stuff was good this week. I really appreciate it. More than appreciate it, I needed to hear it. I needed to hear it. Um, I'll share a little story. It's, it's not a very comfortable story, um, but it kind of illustrates a little bit of the challenge of living uh, the Christian life in this world and the challenge of being a pastor. I really screwed up this week, like majorly, like major pastor screw up, like in the textbooks, like you never make this mistake as a pastor and any pastor who ever makes this mistake is royally made fun of. And that is, in the middle of my funeral sermon, twice, not once, I mentioned a family member by the wrong name. Royal, royal screw-up. And afterwards, it was real challenge because I'm like, I worked hard this week, I slaved away, and then you look up there like some clown that doesn't even know what the family looks like. I had to call the family and apologize and after that, you're sitting to yourself, can't sleep at night, you know, just want to throw in the towel and say, to hell with being a pastor anymore. I don't want to do this anymore. Because, you know, you work your hardest, and in the end, you look like what? You look like a fool. There's that pastor who doesn't even know anybody's name. But, you know, this chapter says something what? Why does the Lord sometimes want to call, cut you off at the knees? Does he always tell you why he wants to do it? He just tells you what? It's at the right time and it's good for you. And you're called to say what? Justification. You're still my child. I've died on the cross for you. I rescued you while you were what? Weak. And your problem, Christopher, is this. You want the glory for what? You were upset about that because what? Because it made me look bad. It's all about what? It's all about me. It's not about you, right? And let me just remind you that it's not about you. But Lord, I don't want to suffer in this way. All right. That's how God treats us in this life. But what are we to say? Our justification isn't based, you know, our standing in the congregation as a church isn't based on the past, the fact that we have a pastor who doesn't forget names or doesn't you know, make you know, mistakes. Our justification is because what? Christ is what? He's died on the cross for us. He's risen. And uh, through him, our salvation is secure. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all.